everybody, welcome back to my channel, The Medieval Reader. So today I want to talk about reading. One of the questions that booktubers have been discussing for the past few years, probably since the beginning of booktube, is one that has been explored from a variety of different angles, but never really from a perspective of the history of reading, at least in the West. And the question is, does listening to an audiobook constitute reading? Do audiobooks count? So today, to answer this question, I would like to give you a little bit of a history of reading in the West and how it has evolved over the centuries. And hopefully by the end of it, you will have an answer. Now this question has been dealt with from the perspective of uh, disability rights. Quite a lot of booktubers have discussed this and I definitely think that their perspective is valuable. But today I want to focus primarily on the history of reading. So something you may not know is that silent reading is quite a modern development. In the ancient world, written texts were delivered orally and there were people who could read, but those people weren't necessarily the same people who could write. So there was only a group of people who were scribes, stenographers, and then other people who were literate, who could read Latin, and then maybe even other people who could read vernacular languages, but they couldn't read Latin and therefore they weren't considered literate. So to be literate meant that you could read Latin, but necess not necessarily that you could write. And the text itself came between the author who delivers the text orally and the audience who receives the text orally, okay, or orally, right, through hearing. Oral rhetoric really directed reading and the consumption of material in the ancient world well through the Middle Ages and through the early modern period. And this isn't just people who uh, were less educated, this is for everybody. People who were, you know, very educated to those who could even, you know, maybe only understand vernacular languages. Regardless of their educational background, people didn't silently read texts. Most of the time they received it orally. And then once again, those who wrote the text down were mostly a particular class of individuals. Stenographers, scribes. Um, that doesn't mean that people who were in scribes were not educated. Um, it's simply that there was a group of people who wrote the text, but they weren't the ones who were delivering the text, necessarily. The reason why I point this out is that if you are reading pre-modern texts, something that was written in the Middle Ages, chances are that work was written to be delivered orally. It was written for social purposes. Reading was a social experience. It wasn't an individual private experience as it is mostly today. Um, and this wasn't just for plays and poems, which of course are social and are supposed to be read out loud, but really any kind of writing, documents, etc. They were written for the purpose of delivering it orally. And so studying pre-modern texts, it's valuable to actually listen to the text rather than read them silently. My introduction to the history of reading um, was in a book called From Memory to Written Record by Michael Clanchy. I will link all the books I mentioned down below. And he particularly looks at the history of reading in England from the Norman Conquest through the 14th century. And what you see is that memory was actually considered more valuable than written records up until really uh, the end of the 12th century, um, where it became more necessary to have physical proof of something for it to be considered real or authentic. Um, before that, collective memory was sufficient. Um, it is why many, many world religions have tradition because tradition was a sufficient evidence uh, for things that occurred um, and so collective memories were often referenced. Furthermore, written texts weren't always very easy to read even if you were literate because there was no spaces between words. So in the ancient world and 
even in some earlier medieval texts, there were no spaces between the words in Latin, which is the reason why Latin has declensions. That was supposed to help with the reading, but initially it was up to whoever was delivering the text to actually make those distinctions between the words because the scribe didn't make those distinctions. So there were no spaces between words. So these texts, when they were even written, were not written to be consulted. In Plato's Phaedrus, which is one of his dialogues, he gives the story um, of a man who talks about writing and how written records are valuable. So here is what the king says to the man who praises writing. O man full of arts, the god-man toth, to one it is given to create the things of art, and to another to judge what measure of harm and of profit they have for those that shall employ them. And so it is that you, by reason of your tender regard for the writing that is your offspring, have declared the very opposite of its true effect. If men learn this, it will implant forgetfulness in their souls. They will cease to exercise memory, because they rely on that which is written, calling things to remembrance no longer from within themselves, but by means of external marks. What you have discovered is a recipe not for memory, but for a reminder. And it is no true wisdom that you offer your disciples, but only the semblance of wisdom. For by telling them of many things without teaching them, you will make them seem to know much, while for the most part they know nothing. And as men filled not with wisdom, but with the conceit of wisdom, they will be a burden to their fellows. So what Plato is saying here through this king is that the problem with reading is that it prevents the reader from using their memory. They are not as easily able to recall things. And we see this in um, cultures that are preliterate. Um, in such communities, people have a greater ability to memorize texts. So maybe they don't have any written records or many written records, but they have remembered these texts. In Benedictine monasteries, there were monks who would have memorized many, many psalms. So one of the consequences of the greater emphasis on reading, and especially um, even before the Gutenberg Press, but of course after the Gutenberg Press as well, um, is that memory is not called upon as frequently. I know for myself, as somebody who mostly reads books and doesn't listen to them, when I am listening to an audiobook, I often get distracted and I don't remember what's being said. And that's because I haven't practiced using sort of that part of my mind. I'm constantly just referencing things in books. So that's another reason why reading was not as encouraged, because it was seen as taking away from memory. So the next thing I want to talk about is um, how private, how reading occurred, basically. So if you were actually reading the text, how did you do that? Well, in the ancient world, reading was mostly done vocally. So silent reading, again, was very rare. Um, and one of the great examples of this is in Augustine's Confessions. So Augustine talks about his uh, mentor and the Bishop of Milan, Ambrose, whom he chances upon reading silently. And here is what Augustine has to say. He's really surprised. He's surprised that his teacher is not moving his lips. Now as he read, his eyes glanced over the pages, and his heart searched out the sense, but his voice and tongue were silent. Often when he came to his room, for no one was forbidden to enter, nor was it his custom that the arrival of visitors should be announced to him, we would see him thus reading to himself. And after we had sat for a long time in silence, for who would dare interrupt one so intent, we would then depart, realizing that he was unwilling to be distracted in the little time he could gain for the recruiting of his mind, free from the clamor of other men's business. Perhaps he was fearful lest, if the author he was studying should express himself vaguely, some doubtful and attentive he hearer would ask him to expound it or discuss some of the more abstruse questions, so that he could not get over as much material as he wished if his time were occupied with others. And even a truer reason for his reading to himself might have been the care for preserving his voice, which was very easily weakened. Whatever his motive was in so doing, it was doubtless in such a man a good one 
So Augustine is actually baffled by Ambrose, who is not moving his lips, and he wonders, perhaps it's because whatever he's reading is not suitable for a group of people who are not accustomed with the, to encountering this author's thought. Or maybe it's to preserve his voice. Now, I have to say that if I read something out loud for mm, 10 minutes, I already feel my mouth drying and I feel that my vocal cords are getting sore. I am not really re used to doing that, but like I said, well through the early modern period, reading was oral and it was social. It was something that people did in groups. Um, you had the Salon, for example, in the 17th century, where you have these female writers who write romances, these really, really, really long romances, and they would deliver them to men and women in their own, in these rooms. Um, and these were very intellectual people. And from my experience, because some texts were written to be heard and not to be read silently, I have found that it often is preferable to listen to an audiobook of one of those texts than to read it. For example, Augustine's City of God. City of God is this, it's like over a thousand pages, I think it's like 24 books. It's really, really lengthy. And there are parts that are repetitive. There are parts that, you know, you can just tell that the ways that books were constructed was very, very different. Augustine certainly did not write this, these by hand, he delivered them orally, and there was a stenographer that took it down. And so listening to it on LibriVox, which is uh, basically an audiobook service that has free audiobooks for books in the public domain, was perfect, it was exactly what I needed. Um, so in some cases, audiobooks are preferred. But ultimately, the question of whether audiobooks constitute reading depends on what you mean by reading. If you mean by reading in the way that we mean mo in the modern sense of reading words on a page, then no, it's not reading. But if the question is whether listening to a book is sufficient, is okay, well, yes, it's actually the most ancient way of reading. And in some cases, it might be the preferred way of reading. Um, so, you know, I think it is important to consider the history of literacy Again, literacy, to be literate, meant to be read, to be able to read Latin. I mean, how many of us can read Latin? I know I can barely read Latin. Um, so you probably wouldn't even be considered literate at that time. And then if you were able to read, you were probably not able to write, which was a, a very different skill. So yeah, this is kind of the history of, of literacy. And um, I hope that, you know, gives you some background about uh, audiobooks. I certainly think that audiobooks constitute reading. Um, and certainly for uh, people who have disabilities, it's absolutely important that we uh, promote and um, encourage uh, audiobooks. But it's also the most ancient way. And I have found that reading pre-modern texts silently, I miss a lot. I might be missing sounds that um, an audience that was listening to those works would have picked up on and I, and I miss it or the translators you know, are very well aware that these texts are supposed to be delivered orally and so their translations are attentive to the sound of the words and then I read it silently and they completely miss what the translator is doing. Um, a great example of that is Sir Gawain and the Green Knight translated by Keith Harrison which was my favorite book of uh, 2017 I believe. So yeah, um, there's a lot more that can be said about this, um, but I would definitely recommend uh, Clanchy's book. And um, there's also a book that I haven't read, but it's about the history of spacing in words and, and how when scribes started putting spaces between words and texts and how that influenced the movement from oral to like written and then to actually reading texts privately. Thank you everybody for watching and I will talk to you later. Bye now.